You are in for a treat this morning. You are going to hear from Dr. Katherine Skinner, who is the Executive Director of Educopia. Now, Katherine is a force and a wonderful, wonderful, thinking, um, creative soul who I met in an IMLS gathering uh, when we, and Jay was there, when we were talking about how can libraries, archives, museums, other CE providers, how can we all work together? And Catherine is instrumental in bringing together a whole bunch of cats in the herd to work on a project called Nexus, and I've, I've just been in awe of her talent for bringing people together and focusing on the things that are really important. I'll read her, her real biography here. She is the executive director of the Educopia Institute, a not-for-profit educational organization that hosts international, international, inter-institutional collaborative programs for the production, dissemination, and preservation of digital scholarship. She is the founding program director for the Meta Archive Cooperative, a community-owned and community-governed digital preservation network founded in 2004 that now has more than 50 member institutions in four countries. She also directs the Library Publishing Coalition Project, a two-year initiative to create a new organization to support library publishing and scholarly communications activities in conjunction with more than 50 academic libraries. So please help me welcome this wonderful lady, Dr. Katherine Skinner. All right, so first off, I want to say thank you to Anne for bringing me and Gwen and the rest of the team, uh, and also to thank all of you guys for being here today. Um, you are, you know, you're signing up for leadership, and I know many of you are already playing that role in your local institutions and probably have been for a long time. But the more that we can learn about leadership, the more that we can be conscious about leadership, the better our leadership will be. And so I really do. I commend Anne for the amazing job that she's done in bringing I Lead You first to the table and then I Lead USA. Um, and I also commend all of you for your involvement in this program. It's a really remarkable program, and I feel really honored to be here with you guys today. So with that said, we're going to go ahead and start the presentation. I'm going to start off back here, but by the time that you guys are all starting to fall asleep, I promise I will be moving. So I will, I will go mobile eventually. Um, but where I want to start today is just a little bit of context about who I am and where I come from. Um, and Anne gave you a little bit, but let me give you just a little bit more. So with Educopia, the purpose of what we're doing is bringing communities together in order to foster and facilitate change. So it, it grew out of work that I was doing at Emory University back in uh, the early 2000s. It, uh, it was a gamble and a half when we founded it. We had no idea how hard it was to found a nonprofit. Otherwise, we may not have done it, but, um, but I'm glad we did. And basically, the reason that we founded the nonprofit was, was two interrelated reasons. We knew that collaboration, we, we fervently believed that collaboration is the only way that we're going to be able to move forward, particularly at a system level. And you'll hear a lot about that in my talk today. The other reason that we did it is because we thought that collaboration is something that right now gets very expensive under grants. And grants, particularly in the academic library community where I was centered, come with a lot of overhead that goes straight to the university. It doesn't go into the project. And we didn't think that that was right. And so figuring out a way to have an intermediary that could sit and basically level the playing field for lots of institutions to be able to partner together both on grants for limited term projects and then on programs that would continue the work well beyond that three year cycle or two year cycle that we're used to in grants were the real reasons for founding Educopia. And it started off very library-centric. So we were concerned with libraries. We were concerned with bridging different sectors of the library communities, so the academic libraries, with the public libraries, with the state libraries, with the special libraries, you know, et cetera. 
Um, but increasingly, we're starting to move further afield than that. So we're also looking at how do we bridge across like sectors, public goods sectors, information sectors. How do we make sure we're connected to the museums, the archives, the scholars, the researchers, the genealogists? How do we foster those connections and really make them something that can help to propel our fields forward? So that's a little bit about me and about my company, just as a, a backdrop. And the other thing that I should tell you is that we're tiny. We're intentionally tiny. I work out of a home office. It's completely intentional. It was part of the design. We want to be as lightweight and as inexpensive as we can possibly be so that the money that comes into Educopia doesn't centralize. It doesn't build up central repositories of information. Instead, we facilitate. We help the libraries embed the infrastructure back at their local places. And we make sure that the servers, the technical infrastructure, the knowledge, all of those things are actually being embedded back in the communities that need them. Thank you so much if you're turning that down so I'm not hearing. I hope y'all aren't hearing it as much as I am. Oof, hurts my ears. <laughs> Thank you. Um, should I turn on this mic? Would that help things? And then maybe we won't have to deal with the other one. There we go. OK, that might be a different type of tenny, but we'll, <laughs> we'll work through it. In any case, that, uh, that desire to keep things very lightweight means that I have a staff that mostly gets funded either by the programs that they run and tiny staff. And they're all out of home offices as well, all over the nation. Um, not all over the nation, because there are only five of them, but in, in different states across the nation. And then uh, what we try to do, again, is facilitate, not lead, so that we are empowering communities. We're not taking from those communities the best and the, uh, you know, kind of centralizing it in one place. We're really trying to make sure that the institutions themselves are constantly benefiting from anything that we do. So you will see that run through everything else that I talk about in this presentation. But where I want to start today is with a very appropriate American metaphor that I think particularly resonates with our location today. So here we are in Illinois, and the metaphor, of course, is the frontier. And when I first started working on digital library projects back in 2001, the uh, frontier is the way that we thought of the digital library landscape. It was full of possibility. Anything could happen. And we uh, discovered over time that there's a funny thing about these frontiers, though. Ultimately, it's a trick of perspective. So the frontier looks very different depending on your vantage point. If you're in the east looking west, it's frontier. That, that west was just a big old frontier. If you're in the west looking backwards, it's a very different view. Because really, the frontier is never as empty as it seems. So we're currently in settlement mode. I would say even now, you know, more than a decade later, in the digital terrain. And we're pioneering in terms of how to use our new communications infrastructure in, in ways that help us to do the knowledge transmission and information transmission that we empower for communities. And establishing a settlement, much less turning it into a thriving city, is difficult at best. And that's because tradition matters. Let me say that again. Tradition matters. Traditional business practice reinforce each other at a system-wide level. And so as we work to establish new practices that fit the contours of our new digital terrain, we're encountering all kinds of points of friction and resistance. You guys don't know anything about that, do you? <laughs> no friction, no resistance. What are you talking about? So we have to strike a balance as we progress. We have to respect and understand the traditions that are already here, because this is not a blank frontier. It is librarianship. We already have established business practices. But also adapt and transform them for a new time. So sociologists and historians have studied these types of transitions extensively. And from their work, we can understand a range of things that these kind of frontier moments offer. We can also predict some of the mile markers that frontiersmen and frontiers women might see along the way when we're doing that temporal journey from frontier to settlement. So we can't necessarily predict where we're going, but we can at least identify the mile markers. Um, and that is to say that the frontier of digital librarianship is a microcosm of something that sociologists and historians have studied for centuries. So we've been trying to understand and, and uh, chart out how do new fields come into business, I mean, come into uh, being? How do new businesses develop? How do new genres come into being? And these, uh, and, and what kinds of dangers and opportunities are there in moments where these changes do happen? And this topic is something that I've obsessed over for a very, very long time. So this is what led me to get my PhD. I got my PhD at Emory University in sociology and American studies. I didn't do it to become a professor. I did it because I had burning questions that I really wanted to answer. 
And those questions were around how new genres of music come into being and what the relationship is between those genres of, of music emerging and social movements. So I was exploring a lot of social movement theory, but I also had to explore a lot of business theory because you can't really study where innovations come from and ignore the music industry if you're talking about genres of music. So for example, I was looking at you know where, where did jazz come from? Where did the Indigo Girls come from? What was this whole mu women's music thing of the 1970s, 80s, 90s? Um, and then, you know, things like where, where did country music come from? What, how did that form as a genre? How did it take on this coherent kind of atmosphere? And all of these topics that I was obsessing over uh, and having a lot of fun studying um, were the things that were consuming me in my early 20s right as I started working as a graduate assistant to make a little bit of money on the side, which those of you who went to graduate school know what that's like. Um, and that job just happened to be in the digital library that was just emerging at that time at Emory University. And I was just blessed to be at the right place at the right time. And for the first six months, it really was just a side job. It was a Mellon-funded projects. They were you know, kind of precursors to DPLA. It was uh, OAI PMH experiments, trying to figure out how to move metadata into central repositories, representing lots of collections from lots of different places. And it took me about six months to actually take it seriously. You know, For a while, it was just, eh, whatever. And then after about six months, I realized that everything I was studying in graduate school all of the lessons that I was learning about how businesses change and, and uh, transmorph over time were directly applicable to libraries and that libraries weren't thinking of themselves as businesses and that the digital age could actually upend everything that we have traditionally built around the public good. And that worried me. And when I get worried, I get passionate and I go after things. So that's what wound up uh, leading me to pursue my career as a librarian. I wasn't content to just study institutional changes. I wanted to actually use what I was learning in the classroom and what I was learning in my research to help libraries revolutionize the way that they acquire, disseminate, and preserve content. And librarianship has been for me, and I suspect for most of you, a really wonderful launching point for radical change. Radical is not a word that we often use to describe ourselves. I think we should. What we are doing in a very, very commercialized world is extremely radical. We are advocating for communities and for lots of different types of communities to have open access to as much information as we can possibly get to them and to organize it in ways that make it relevant and useful for their everyday lives. That's radical stuff, folks. Um, I think we often uh, sell ourselves a little bit short in terms of just how much we are trying to accomplish in, in a world that's really positioned in opposition to the values that we hold so dear. Now, I promise that I'm not going to bore you with a scholarly uh, uh, kind of conversation here, but I do want to talk about some of the things that I've learned from sociology and some of the things that I consider my own guiding principles that help me to understand where we are on this kind of trajectory from frontier to settlement and how I use those in my own work and how I would encourage others to use those as framing devices to help you understand where we are and how we might be able to move more quickly towards a better future for libraries and for the public good. So, one of the things that we find in sociology is that whether you're looking at the railroad industry or medicine or academia or banking, I mean, it, it really doesn't matter. Take your pick of industries. They don't organize in permanent manners. Instead, what happens is that they stay susceptible to and they respond to big moments of change. So principle one is beware changes in the modes of communication. Plato predated sociology by a lot in saying this basically about uh, music. So beware changes in the modes of music uh, because they could cause a full-scale revolution, he tells us in, uh, in one of his earliest treatise, treatises. And so the, the concept goes back a long time. How does it actualize? So when you think about a concrete example, you can look at the printing press, something that all of us know quite a bit about, and think about the way that the printing press transformed society and laid the groundwork for a significant religious and political change. I mean, it was the agent that allowed those things to happen. And so just to touch on one small piece of this, look to the church. So by the time that the printing press came into being, the church was this very deeply conservative institution. And I don't mean conservative, conservative in a negative or political sense, but conservative in the sense that it had very strong, uh, kind of stringent guidelines on how things were done. And that very deeply conservative infrastructure began to splinter into a multidimensional field of practice where Christianity no longer meant Catholic and where priests no longer controlled the message in the market. 
the people had access to the message for the first time. They had the Bible, and they could interpret it for themselves. So modes of communication matter, and changes within them can open doors to radical societal, societal change. And that brings us to principle two, that established industries are rarely the spaces where innovation happens. So we can't look to the giants of industry or to the leaders of the past to show us new ways forward. Instead, it's usually the innovators at the fringes of a field that have the capacity to redefine the operations of that field. So I'll draw from music for my example on this. I love that photograph. Uh, so take, for example, the phonograph. There was a huge market for the phonograph in the 1920s, in the early 1920s, and for phonograph records in particular. And most of those that manufactured phonographs also manufactured the players. So you had kind of this vertical alignment of practice. And there were about 150 companies, some of them you guys would know the names of, so Edison and Victor, Victor and uh, RCA and Columbia. These are just a few of lots and lots of these that were out there. It was a thriving market. So then 1922, the radio. The radio comes in, and even though the quality of radio was extremely poor, the meaning of radio was huge. And so it became very popular, and sales of, of records went on decline as a result. And these companies that were manufacturing the records suffered a lot. And so by the time that the Great Depression rolled around, the market for records had already largely collapsed. And then around 1930, it began to rebound. And that's where things get interesting. So why did it rebound? What happened? The jukebox. Jukeboxes weren't created by people at the center of the industry. They weren't created by some you know, person at Victor who said, I'm tired of my record sales declining. Let's invent something that will make it better. Instead, there were these French players called AMI. And they took an invention that actually had happened a little while earlier and brought it in at the Great Depression, right when the social clubs and the restaurants were, were seeking ways to efficiently and inexpensively provide music for their clientele which was something that was expected at that point in time, and they couldn't afford it anymore. And so instead of having live music, which they couldn't afford anymore, they started using the jukebox. And so this landscape change happened as a result of a number of different factors that switched in the environment. But the innovation wasn't something that came from the center. It came from the fringes. So the jukebox provided a steady stream of music, and it did it at a low cost. Records were usually changed out weekly in order to keep the music fresh, which meant a huge supply of records was now needed, and the phonograph uh, record market rebounded. And when jukeboxes took off, they revolutionized the industry in multiple ways, including through making audible, for the first time, music by African Americans. So the jukebox marked white America's first full exposure to black music, and it opened the door for uh, African-American musicians to, partic to participate actively in the musical fabric of the US. So prior to this time, that was banned from the radios. That was not something that was uh, uh, on offer. And now for the first time, ragtime, blues, R&B, early R&B, all were audible to white public and became something that, that became hits, crossover hits, across both the African-American market and the uh, white market in America, which was a huge change for both the industry in terms of the phonograph record sales and then also for music itself. Pretty cool, right? So innovations tend to come from the fringes, not the center, and they often bring new voices into the national conversation as they succeed, and that's revolutionary. Which brings us to the third principle, and this is the end of the principles. And this runs counter to our notions of the rugged individualism that define the settlers of the frontier landscape of the US. Single innovators do not create change. That lone genius concept that we were all raised on and schooled on, it's a fallacy, and it's been pretty roundly debunked in sociological circles. Instead, those innovators are key parts of a larger cultural system of production, of dissemination, and of reception. And that system always, 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 always depends on networks of people. And it's these networks that work together to legitimize an innovation. It's the networks of people that move it from the fringes to the center. And I can think of no better set of images to illustrate this point than this. Does anybody know what this is? This is the Castellers of, Ca of Catalonia, or Barcelona, as it's more commonly known, uh, at least over here. And basically what you're looking at in these first two images is, oh, I don't have to lean into the microphone. In these first two images, you're looking at, uh, you're looking down on a crowd of people. 
And basically, these people come together to build several story high towers of human beings. And this is a sport. It's been going on for centuries. It's fantastic. I would love to see this in person. And so they can make these, I mean, multiple stories high. But the only way that you can make something that's multiple stories high is to have a really strong base. And the only way to have that strong base is to spread out. So you'll see the bottom down here actually looks like this if you look at it from above. And you've got tons and tons and tons of people who are all holding on to each other and providing this stable base at the bottom, their big network, in order to allow the building up, the uh, new uh, construction, if you will. And so these networks of people in sociological terms, this is uh, an important piece of the fabric. So you don't just have Beethoven, and Beethoven writes something beautiful, and here we go, here it is. We have that type of music you know, kind of uh, everywhere. It doesn't work that way. It's about the networks of people that surround that music, how it's disseminated, how it's used, how it's received that actually makes the difference. And when you think about that, not in musical terms, but instead in industry terms, or maybe in musical industry terms, um, something like uh, the, well, let's go with a different example, something like the printing press. The printing press wasn't invented at the moment that it became popularized. It was invented in Japan several centuries early, earlier than that. And the only reason that it did not become a, a huge part of the world culture at that time is because there wasn't a network of people surrounding it. The innovation happened, it was an interesting innovation, but an innovation is just an innovation if it doesn't have the storytellers all around it to give it meaning. So the church, Christianity, became the storytellers that helped to give the printing press meaning. So how does all of this sociological knowledge apply to our, our current circumstances in the field of librarianship? So we'll start with the obvious. We have to beware the changes in the modes of communication. Our primary mode of communication has shifted. We all know this. We've gone from, uh, we've gone basically in the same kind of direction that the printing press uh, inspired years before. So we've moved from a mostly print culture to a mostly digital culture, and we've done so about that quickly. Um, it, the internet provides this faster, freer way of disseminating information, and it has dramatic implications for libraries, publishers, and other groups with an interest that in, in the dissemination of information. And then let's translate the second principle. So you have dramatic change, and it doesn't usually emerge from the center of an industry where practices are well established. It typically unfolds in the margins instead. And although we don't usually think of ourselves in these terms, we are a very conservative industry. We use an established business model that has evolved over centuries of print culture, and we've barely modified it. But at least we're starting to notice it, and that is the first step forward. There are innovations all around us, and I'm gonna share a few of my favorites with you later in this talk. Most of these innovations have not started at the center of our industry. Instead, they're taking place elsewhere, on the margins and on the fringes. And then finally, let's translate principle three, which I've already done to some degree. So those innovations are not created by lone geniuses, and they're not guaranteed to succeed, no matter how brilliant they are. So in, in the uh, grand scheme of things, the innovation is the first step towards change. But it has to have this set of storytellers and this network around it, or else it stops there, and the innovation has no effect. So right now, we're beginning to see some networks form that support and advocate for some of the innovations around us today. And these networks could transform librarianship and other public good industries. But first, those networks need to grow stronger and broader. Because system-wide change requires system-wide involvement. Or to say that another way, we can't make system-level prog progress by treating institution-level interests. And right now, our networks don't include all of the players that need to coordinate in order to move our operations up several levels. We as libraries can't work in a silo to transform to meet the challenges of our increasingly digital world. We're all part of a bigger system. We have to work directly with the other stakeholders in the cycle, the creators, the publishers, the users, all of these different groups that interact with the library in order to make sure that this information gets out there. And then we have to remind the other players, and perhaps ourselves as well, why we matter, what we do. So our mission as libraries is to support and sustain access to our cultural, political, and scientific memory, to disseminate and preserve knowledge as freely as possible because knowledge itself is a public good. That's radical, again, 
You know, it's radical and it's wonderful. And nobody else has quite that mission. So we need to embrace that and articulate it as we continue to struggle through what I think is a critical moment for libraries and for public good institutions writ large. That's why alignment is such a powerful tool. I pivot around to the same question over and over again. How can we tap into the communities around us so that we as librarians, researchers, scholars, publishers, and producers can work together to build a strong digital infrastructure that serves our mission well and then ensures the broadest possible transmission of knowledge? And that brings us to the three C's, where we'll focus the remainder of this presentation. So we've got choice, chance, and change. What role is each playing in the shifting libra librarianship landscape? And how can we, in this critical moment, use these three Cs to transform both our field and our society for the better? And let me emphasize here that I do think librarianship is poised to transform society for the better. Many of you are already actively engaged in that work, and the very fact that you're here today is evidence that you want to lead our field toward a stable and productive future. So we matter, and we need to remember that we matter so that we do what we need to transform our field now, which is ambitious. And I stay ambitious, and I stay ambitious for a good reason. It's for these guys. These are my kids. And these guys motivate me. I'm laying the groundwork today for the world that they're going to live in tomorrow. And I take that really seriously. And these guys also teach me. So here, they are teaching me about chance. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. <laughs> so chance matters. It keeps us interested. And I can get my kids to play rock, paper, scissors absolutely anywhere at absolutely any time, which is amazing. Because <laughs> for a long time, all we could do is get them to fight. Um, but we can, we can distract them from their fighting and get them to play this game absolutely anywhere and any time for one very simple reason. They never know how it's going to turn out. Or at least they shouldn't actually know how it's going to turn out. But my six-year-old, the wise and ever-present Gabe, who's over on the, the uh, right-hand side there, Gabe has figured out that he can game the system. So he says to his brother a couple of weeks ago, hey, Wes. And Wes says, what? He says, you should pick paper this time. And I'll pick rock so that you can throw me away. And then, of course, what does he actually do when they get to their rock? Paper, scissors. He doesn't choose rock. He's not getting thrown away. He chooses scissors. So my kiddo has already learned to game the system and can get his very compliant three-year-old brother to go along with this. It's totally unfair. Just not right. So chance is supposed to be the major factor in rock, paper, scissors and the thing that makes it fun. But relating this back to librarianship, all of us are sitting here watching and waiting and sometimes participating, but mostly watching and waiting with bated breath to see what's going to get thrown our way next. So we've had rock, paper, computers, rock, paper, internet, rock, paper, mobile devices, rock, paper, maker spaces. It's exhausting. It's coming all the time. There are so many waves of change right now, and there's no sign that it's going to slow down on the horizon. And each one of those transitions in our communications infrastructure provides us with an open moment in which massive changes can occur. So remember, sociologists have told us that even these permanent structures, these business infrastructures that have been here for a long time, become really permeable. They, they can change a lot when the modes of communications change. So ultimately, we're playing a game in a certain way, and it's exciting. And we're not alone. There are lots of others, rock, paper, scissoring right alongside us. And those include publishers of all stripes, from the little to the colossal. And they also include information management groups, like Amazon, Google, other corporations, that seek to provide their customers with access to content, but for a price and for commercial gain. And interestingly, during these chance moments of transition, some of those entities have done things that are very similar to what Gabe just did to his little brother in my story. So they rigged the system to their own advantage. Oh, come play with us, they say. We'll play fair, they say. And over and over, we choose to do so. 
So we have to be honest with ourselves that we're making that choice field-wide. We're playing by the rules of the industry that is selling products to us. And yeah, I know that that choice has felt like this far side moment. There's your ebook peddler, right? Rent? Rent or not rent? Ha ha, just kidding. But in all sincerity, I have to pause here and say that I actually don't think that the publishers or the commercial entities are devils. I mean, they, it, it's fun to characterize them that way, but they aren't. Um, they are motivated by different things from us, and they're supposed to be. So publishers and commercial information groups want to package and sell valuable products and services. They create a system of scarcity in order to create value, and there's nothing fundamentally wrong with that. They're businesses. This is what they're supposed to do. And they're businesses that are operating in really unstable, uncertain times. You know, most of the publishers have been bought out, they've merged, they've had all of these major periods of upheaval in their own industrial uh, environments. And in many cases, they've been bought out by corporations that don't specialize in publication. So you know, industries that are controlling publishing now are involved in other types of manufacturing, you know, food products, all kinds of things. And publishing is this one teeny tiny thing within what they're doing. So I have to say that those that figured out that the digital world provides a base for renting access to content rather than selling it are absolutely brilliant business people. They've provided products and services that we've willingly bought and we continue to buy regardless of the constraints that they impose and regardless of the prices that they charge. They are acting out of self-interest, not because they're bad, but because they're seeking survival in an increasingly unpredictable marketplace. And we have become their predictable purchasers. And we're being taken for a ride and most of us know this. We're key players in this game, and we're a very important market. And the only thing that makes us this vulnerable is that we're not banded together in any way that makes us a force together. Instead, we stand as individual institutions. So here's my question. Why do we choose this? Why are we still choosing to buy products that don't serve our needs adequately? Why do we continue to choose to sign and honor non-disclosure agreements that silence us from sharing information with our peers about what we're buying, at what price, and with what restrictions? Why do we pay for access to e-books under the massive constraints that the publishers have set in place instead of banding together as a major market segment to insist on terms that allow us to do our jobs? Why are we choosing to let a marketplace impinge on our very missions as libraries? Every single time we shift from acquiring permanent collections to acquiring temporary rented collections, we are ceasing to serve the public good. Why are we playing by rules that do not serve libraries and that do not serve our communities? Why are we playing by rules that don't even serve the publishers in the long run? After all, the heyday is over. The whole system is collapsing under the weight of the recession and under all of these modes of communication changes. There's no longer enough money in the system to support the publishers. The well is running dry. So sociology says that there are many ways out of the conundrum that we're currently in, which is the good news. And biology agrees. It tells us that, the, that strength is not the best predictor of who's going to survive. Instead, flexibility is the trait that matters the most. <laughs> flexibility. And with the continual interruptions of the established business practices that we're engaged in, if we are wise and we're flexible and we use our connections well, we can turn the situation around. In trying times, we've got a number of responses that we can choose, and I'll name just a few. So we can resist change by doing the same damn thing that we've always done, excuse my language. Or we can embrace change by being on the leading edge of it, totally different. Or we can move in considered ways, making incremental changes as they make sense in our environment. And I would say most of us are already doing number three, which is the one that sounds the most sensible out of those to you know, rational people. Um, but fundamentally, none of those responses, not number one, not number two, not number three, are at all helpful if they're done by individual institutions. We need to flexibly move forward as a community and as a network if we want to create a landscape in which we can accomplish our core mission as state libraries, local public libraries, academic libraries, special libraries, archives, and myriad other library types. And that mission is to acquire, disseminate, and preserve information about and for the communities that we serve. So what are our choices today in this critical moment for libraries? And where might we invest differently in order to make the system-wide changes that we need? I have a couple of suggestions and a couple of trends that I think are really well worth watching. 
um, out in the environment today. And I'll wear my biases in this. So let me start with the full disclosure that I am speaking from what I know and that the examples that I've chosen are ones that for the most part I'm involved in or I'm leading. And that's deliberate. I know the most about these. Um, but I think they also suit this. The reason that I've chosen to lead these things is because I do think that they've got transformative potential in the environment that we're in right now. So the first of those is library publishing. And as Anne mentioned, one of the things that Educopia is involved in right now is a, a coalition building project that wraps up this January and that actually successfully launched a new organization in July of this year uh, with about 60 uh, academic and research libraries around library publishing. So for more than two decades, we've seen experiments in publishing, and they've happened on the academic side, and they've happened on the public side. Um, on the academic side, it's been a lot of digital scholarship that has been humanities-based, uh, a lot of you know, crazy website-driven projects that uh, academic librarians go crazy about because they're so hard to maintain, they're so hard to preserve, they're so hard to carry forward. Um, but there have also been these innovations on the more text-based uh, materials that have taken place in both the academic libraries and in the, the public libraries, where you have a number of libraries now providing services. In some cases, something as low as just connecting people to Lulu or another self-publishing platform. But in other cases, they're actually taking on some of the distribution, dissemination work, and are trying to help bridge the gap between uh, the production of a, a new work and getting that into libraries, getting that into the public hands, getting that out there, and getting it known. So in the Library Publishing Coalition, what we're trying to do is bridge the folks that are doing this. And we're starting with academic libraries because that's the group that uh, had the, the easiest foundation to build, but we're hoping to involve more and more public libraries in this as time goes forward. Um, because the models are similar, they're different, they've got distinctions, but they're similar and some of the concerns are similar across the two areas. And I would say one of the trends here, the trend that I'm pointing to here that is worth watching and is worth participating in to the degree that you can, is the concept of the library as a publisher. You know, just as we're a maker space now, especially on the public library side, and I love the work that's going on with 3D printing in public libraries across the nation right now. I think it's just absolutely fantastic. But in a similar way, the, the getting out of the written word in lots of different forms, um, helping people to become authors who otherwise can't get their voices heard. They don't have literary agents. They don't have a publisher. Why can't we be that? It's not a terribly difficult proposition, and one of the benefits that comes from libraries being involved in the publishing process is that hopefully we actually own the content, or at least own enough of the rights to the content that we can preserve it, which we can't do right now with eBooks, and it's one of the things that we should be very, very concerned about. So looking at this as one of those places where we can take on uh, a new task that isn't overly arduous, that rewards our community, broadens the base of creators, broadens the base of content, and that keeps our voices in it at the instrumental level where we can actually make sure that there's good metadata at the moment of creation, that we can make sure that the format that it's created in is something that might last more than for you know, a year. Um, it, it is an area that a lot of libraries are exploring, and it's an area that I think is very fruitful for exploration for libraries. Second area, web archiving. And I have to say here that of all the things that I didn't think I would be standing up and saying in 2014, go do web archiving is not what I thought I'd be saying in 2014. I thought that this would already be well taken care of. And what's actually happened is that very few of us are capturing what's out there on the web. And what's out there on the web is in many cases the digital history of tomorrow. So these, this is where people go for their information. And there is one group out there that's doing a diligent job of capturing some of it, and that's the Internet Archive. Um, how many of you know about the Wayback Machine? How many of you have used it in the last month? I use it all the time. Um, the Wayback Machine is fantastic. The Internet Archive is fantastic. Brewster Kale, my hat's off to him. For anybody to make lots of money in the dot-com uh, boom and then turn that to a public service like this, Hats off to him, he's brilliant. Um, and his team is absolutely fantastic. But they're not a library. Where are we, guys? What they're doing is taking snapshots, and they're doing it at a very broad level so that you get iterative snapshots of the web. And that's valuable, it helps us. It means that if a link goes down, or like uh, back during the government shutdown, um, when all the links to you know, massive research databases went down, I needed research databases. 
Um, and where I was able to go is the Wayback Machine. And there are moments like that that happen for me all the time. They're not usually as dramatic as the government shutdown. But they're, they're important. And that government shutdown la lasted for a long time. And it was one of those illustrations that without access to content that we can consider perpetual, we really are vulnerable. We're at risk. And that was mended, you know, thankfully, um, for all sorts of reasons, thankfully. But it, it was one of those moments that highlighted the work of the Internet Archive and that, for me, raised the question, why the Internet Archive? Why not libraries? So back in 2003-ish, I had the great honor of uh, bringing Vicki Reich, who is one of the principals at the LOX Project, which I'll, I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, she came to Emory. She is an activist and a half. She has dedicated her career to helping think about how to build collections and sustainable collections, uh, mainly in academic libraries. That's where her focus has been, and it's been mostly on e-journals. But her uh, passion and her drive has been about, you know, wh where are our collections for tomorrow? How are we going to take care of the digital record? And so she works in digital preservation. Um, and we had this phenomenal conversation. She was one of the first people that I'd ever talked to who was more passionate than I was about the topic of future content. And we decided in that conversation that surely within the next decade this would be underway and that lots of people would be doing web archiving because, of course, the special collections of tomorrow are happening right now on the web. But it's still not happening. Deep dives, we're missing them entirely. The Wayback Machine does not do deep dives. The Wayback Machine and the Internet Archive capture snapshots. Where this hurts us the most is news. So when you think about libraries' connections to the public, and you think about local libraries' connections to their communities, or state libraries' connections to their states, um, or academic libraries' connections to their campuses, one of the places where we have always had a treasure trove is on the news side. We've maintained copies of the newspaper. But the news isn't newspapers for the most part anymore. I mean, we do still have them delivered to doorstops. There is still a print version. But that's only one version of news that's changing all the time. And I don't know about the right, well, actually, let's get a show of hands. So how many people here depend largely on the print newspaper that's delivered to your doorstep in the morning? How many of you depend on digital news? Yeah. How many of you have ever worried about what's happening to that digital news after the headline is done? A few of you. Hey, that's wonderful. That's more than I've ever seen in a room before. This is the thing that, honest to God, keeps me up at night right now. Because I think we've already created this huge gaping chasm, this huge black hole in our cultural memory because we're not taking snapshots of what's happening in the digital news today. As a scholar and as a researcher, I've depended on newspapers plenty of times in order to understand and make sense of the history of events. And if I was looking backwards 20 years from now and trying to make sense of, say, how journalism changed, how the entire industry shifted, I'm not going to be able to see that because nobody's been collecting the comment streams. Nobody's been collecting the three and four and five updates to stories that happen every hour. When breaking news happens, these really incredible patterns emerge. And we could learn things from those patterns, but we're not doing the work that we usually do as libraries around things like the news to make sure that that's going to be able to be known. And I worry a lot about that. And I worry about the lack of connections. We had these workflows in place that worked very gracefully between uh, libraries, vendors that we subscribed to, library con uh, to newspaper content from, and the newspapers themselves. And those workflows served us well both in print and then in microfiche. And now in digital, they're broken in most states, in most locations. There are a few states that at least have some press associations, Kentucky is one, that are doing really amazing things. This guy, David Thompson is one of the, the renegades in the system. And he has managed to make sure that the print PDFs, the print-ready PDFs, are now being transitioned into a digital uh, preservation channel from most of the newspapers in Kentucky, which is huge. It's not happening anywhere else that I know of. A Little bit in Texas, but nowhere else. Um, but that's the print PDFs. It's just the PDFs. That's not the news. The news is the weeklies. It's the, the individual content that happens in our local uh, arrangements. And it's often the stuff that gets either blogged or put up on the website. It's not the stuff that's going into the paper itself. So there's this disconnect right now between what we're doing and how we're collecting and what content is out there that needs collecting. We're still collecting as though we live in a print culture. We're not living in a print culture anymore. How many people in here are web archiving? 
got one institution, maybe two. Is your institution doing it or are you doing it personally? Personally and both. So it's this minuscule little bit of work that's going on right now. And I swear, if there's anything that we're going to look back at with regret, this is going to be it. So if, I don't, if nothing else that I talk about today gets, gets to you in any way, shape, or form, start worrying about digital news with me, please, because I need some company. <laughs> and here's one of the places that you can go to give me that company. So we are, we're, um, I'm on the program committee for this, the Reynolds Journalism Institute, which is not too far away from you guys. It is in driving distance. A um, little bit of a long drive. I think it's about four hours from here. Is that right, Columbia, Missouri? Um, but that's drivable, and for, for many of you, not for all of you, because I know y'all are from across the U.S. But this forum is one of the first times that we're bringing together journalists, newspaper uh, owners, uh, libraries, archives, uh, different groups, all the different stakeholders, the press associations. You can actually go to the website, and the URL is up there. Um, you can go to the website, and you can see who all is attending. And if anybody wants to get in and is actually within driving range or is willing to make this journey, just contact me after this event, and I'll make sure that you get in. Um, registration's free. It's, it really is. It's an open conversation. And what we want is as broad a mix of the stakeholders who can make this happen as possible. And then I'm going to be hosting a second event in North Carolina as a follow-on action assembly to this, because I don't like hosting events where you just go and talk. I don't like talk. I'll do it. <laughs> I'm doing it today. But what I really like is action. And so what we're trying to do here is lay the groundwork for some action. And then over the next six months after the November conference, we're going to be engaged in some direct action as an outcome of this. And then we'll all come back together in North Carolina, at least for those who can, and we'll have some virtual ability to chime into the conversation there as well so that we can measure what progress we've made in six months and start to think about what the next steps are. So anybody who, is, who has their interest peaked, please get in touch with me about both of those events. Now moving on to the third thing that I think is a trend that we should be paying attention to and is something that we're not doing enough of, it's preservation. And LOCKS is not the only way to preserve by any stretch of the imagination. But I put it up here because it's the example I like best. And I like it best not because I'm using it in my own digital preservation network, which I own, um, meaning I own that, that fact, um, but because of the model that LOCKS uses. What LOCKS does is it doesn't centralize the infrastructure. It doesn't say, let's build a big server farm over here, or let's outsource to, God forbid, the, uh, you know, the cloud, the cloud, um, and put all of our control of our content to the side and just move it into the spaces that we know we're going to pay for in order to make sure that we're maintaining our digital record. Instead, what LOX does is it says, let's embed that infrastructure locally. Because if we all do it, we can do it inexpensively. We don't need fancy equipment. All we need is a basic server and a network connection and the right software that makes replications of content, stores it in lots of different places, and then lets those copies check back with each other on a regular basis. And she managed to build, Vicki and David Rosenthal and her team, managed to build this really incredible, again, mostly academic library-centric network that's called the Public Locks Network that has been preserving content for 15 years now. So preservation's been happening, but it's been happening in these very small spaces. Very few, only the largest, really, and, and some of the more prestigious private institutions are doing it even on the academic side. And I say even on the academic side because they're the ones that took the most active voice in this first. On the state library side, only a handful are really doing solid digital preservation practices. The Library of Congress, it's trying. But it's, a, you know, it's complicated not to crack, but it's at least there, and it certainly has been involved in seeding a lot of the activities that have happened, including through its INDIP program. Um, but overall, especially when you start looking down to the public library level, we're doing very little to make sure that the collections that we do have are actually going to stay sustainable in the future. So go hear Alice talk more about this uh, later on today. And, and this is another one of those places that if you're not already paying attention and you're not already thinking about it, please do give this some thought. These things need to be things that we're talking about as librarians. I think one of the biggest problems that we have in our local infrastructures is that we're so busy doing our day-to-day -day jobs that we don't even dare to dream up a level or two. So the thought of doing something like web archiving, oh god, that's too hard. I don't want to do it. I don't know how to get started. I'm mm, not going to talk about that. Or preservation, whoa, way too much responsibility, way too much technology, way too much knowledge that I don't have yet. I'm just going to back off from it. We can't afford to do that. We're going to get outdated, outmoded, and outplayed very quickly uh, over the course of the next 20 years if we are not taking uh, part in these things. 
So with all of that said, where are some of the low-hanging fruit uh, that we can actually start to work on? So I've identified a lot of the things that I think are, are trends that are worth watching, but what are the actionable steps and where would I advise us um, in my high and lofty position as keynote to, uh, to do some things? The first thing that I would say is that we need to stand together as a community. And I think ebooks are one of the places where there's a natural need for us to stand together as a community. We need to be sharing more information. We need to be talking more broadly. We need to be thinking actively about what it means to rent access to collections instead of having permanent collections. And think about ways that we can work with the ebook publishers so that, I mean, they're a stakeholder. They have an interest in this too. They should have an interest in preservation. How do we make sure that they understand what it is that we're offering to do for them? It's a service. It's actually a service the library can provide. And so making sure that we've got the rights to preserve their content is something that we should be working actively towards as libraries. And it may be one of the things that we can bring to the table to offset some of the ridiculous prices that they're offering us right now. So banding together. You know, it's something that we can do, and the, the fact that so much of the labor movement uh, happened kind of in the backyard of where I am right now. I passed by, when I was driving up 55, a Mother Jones memorial that I'm going to go back to tomorrow. Yeah, it, I can't wait. Um, I'm going to somehow get that in tomorrow morning before I go on board my plane. But, um, but those, those types of communal actions are incredibly powerful, and it is the way that we can make sure that our voice expands. Second thing that we can do is enter into some hardcore collaboration with our neighbors. There are other public good institutions and they're facing many of the same dilemmas that we are right now. Underfunding, um, you know, a kind of cultural misperception of who we are and what we do. Museums, archives, libraries, there are a lot of things that do unite us. That doesn't mean that we all do the same job or that we're all trained the same, we're not. But there are things in terms of advocacy messages that we could be working together to build that could have more strength if they were coming from multiple sectors at the same time. And so I'd encourage us all to, on both the local level, so those of you who are working in libraries, you know, if you're in a public library and there's a museum in your town, how well do you know the museum? How well do they know you? Children's museum, zoo, you know, all of these different uh, environments that share some of the same characteristics as the library in terms of trying to make sure that knowledge and information and access is there for folks. These are, the, these are people and, and groups that we really need to get to know better. So I, I challenge you all at your local level to try to get to know people and to think about where you can build bridges between some of the projects that you're doing in order to get better scale through bridging across those different groups. Third thing, and this is something that I don't hear a lot about, and it may be that I'm not in the right circles, and I hope that that's all it is, but we should be the guard dogs of personal privacy. Privacy is going to be, it already is a hot topic, it is going to be one of the central things that determines what people can and can't do in the next generation. We are living in 1984. I mean, it is uncanny the degree to which science fiction novels are starting to come true in terms of how much control Big Brother has. We need advocates for that, and I can think of no better set of, of people in terms of our connections to communities who can actually make meaningful change happen on this front, because most people are just too scared. They don't know what to do, how to do it, you know, they, they, and we don't either. I mean, none of us do. But if we work at a local level, and if we can combine forces with groups like ACLU and other policy-oriented groups that are fighting this fight, um, we may be able to do some things before it's too late. And we need to, because otherwise society as a whole is going to suffer. Thinking about that picture of my two kids, I worry about them. I worry about what their digital uh, information is going to look like and what their identity is going to be like and how much of their safety and freedom is going to be compromised by things that we're letting pass today. So having libraries play that role, I think, is, is both fruitful and necessary. I don't know who else is going to do it. Um, and then finally, we need to organize our own doggone documentation better. So when we do have ways of doing things, whether it's creating a makerspace, um, or whether it's launching a new community program, or whether it's creating a digital preservation strategy that's affordable, that can actually be replicated by other groups, we need to be writing that up and we need to be doing it in little briefs. And there needs to be some place where we're organizing this information so that there are ways that communities can very quickly gauge what they might be able to do. Because I am absolutely convinced that all of us are capable of more than what we're doing right now in our infrastructures if only we had the ready tools to provide that apparatus. So as leaders and future leaders, 
if anybody can come up with ways to do this, and Jay, I think on the continuing ed front, you're, you're getting there. You know, figuring out how to, how to understand what the state of the field is and what the options are and do that in bite-sized chunks is tremendously important work and could really forward the field very quickly. Because remember, innovating is only the first part of the story. So we can have those innovations, and they can be exactly what we need. But if you don't have the networks and communities to tell those stories and to replicate those findings, then the innovation dies. And then finally, I do have to add one more. Web archiving. Please, 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 please go back and think about web archiving on whatever level. One of my favorite examples right now is this, uh, this kid from the picture. Um, who is going to be at the Missouri event, and whose name I'm blanking on right now, and I didn't make a slide for this. Um, but he is taking snapshots three times a day of all the major news sites. He's in violation of all kinds of copyright laws. I mean, but he doesn't care. He is putting it out there, and it's actually out there. If you do a, a search for, I don't know, come find me later if you want to know more about it, um, and I'll, I'll make sure and connect you with it. I can't think of what it's called right now. It's not press forward. That's a different thing. Um, Oh, I wish I could remember. Past pages. There it is. Past pages is, is what he's working on. And it's, I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. And he's done it with a little bit of Kickstarter startup money and with a whole lot of bravery, honestly, and maybe, maybe a little bit of naivete about how much trouble he could eventually get into. Um, but mostly, I think he believes that what he's doing is a public good and that that will ultimately protect him. And I look at that and I think, why is that not a librarian? Why is that a journalism? graduate that's doing that and not a librarian. So think about the ways that you can do it, even on a personal level. So I want to wrap up the presentation by thinking aloud about what sociologists call isomorphism. It's a really fancy word, isomorphism, or isomorphism, which is a, it's just a way of saying resistance to change. So we get into habits, and they're really hard to change once they're well established. So to illustrate this, I want to share with you the story of Mohini who was a white tigress that was presented to President Eisenhower in the Washington, D.C. Zoo in the 1920s, or 19 teens, I think it was 1916. The tiger started off in a 12 by 12 cage, which was typical at that point in time. It was in the lion section, and she paced back and forth and back and forth, and combined, in that confinement, she habituated her movement to her environment. And the D.C. Zoo wanted to do something special. And this was right as natural habitats were becoming part of uh, what, what zoos were aspiring to, at least the, the national zoos. And so the D.C. Zoo built her a new environmental habitat that was much more in keeping with what a tiger would normally find herself in. So acres of land where she could wander and nap and run and pounce and do all those tigery things that she's supposed to be doing. Except by the time that they moved her, isomorphism had set in. She was set in her ways. And so she claimed a little 12 by 12 area, and she paced back and forth and back and forth in that 12 by 12 area for the rest of her life. I worry that we're a bit like Mohini in the library landscape. We had an established way of doing our work that functioned well for several centuries. And now we have the opportunity to do so much more, to carry forward our mission as libraries in less confined territory, to acquire, disseminate, and preserve across networks to ensure that knowledge is transmitted as freely as possible and to as many people as possible. So will we act like Mohini? Or will we see the broader landscape around us and risk stepping into it? Leadership requires a will to take risks. How big can you dream? How wide can you cast your network? How much will you give up in order to move forward? These are the questions that I believe we as leaders must ask ourselves constantly. And if we do, and if we're guided in that work by our missions as librarians, as a key part of the public good, we will work together to accomplish transformations of our field that empower more people to create, to know, and to be informed. The major opportunity that we have today is that we as a knowledge-loving community, and we are, we are a knowledge-loving community. I saw that at Battle Decks last night. We love knowledge. I was amazed at how many people knew the historical images, and that was not normal. <laughs> So we need to think about what our communities need in terms of today's historical records, and we need to actively collaborate to build the infrastructure necessary to support it. That's hard work. It's not impossible work. And if we don't do it, we won't be able to continue serving this core function for the communities that we serve. Future researchers are depending on us to figure this out. It's our responsibility, and we must begin actively archiving digital histories before we create a several-decade-wide memory hole. 
To accomplish anything of this scale, we have to work together. Libraries, museums, archives, researchers. We have to get to know one another and get comfortable establishing common goals that we can work towards both within and across our sector-based boundaries. The alternative, which is carrying on, is that the world hasn't changed, is a sure way for libraries, museums, and archives to themselves become relics that are outpaced by the many, many competitors, Google, Amazon, and the like, who seek to commodify information. They're very, very good at it. But coalitions are powerful. We're bigger and louder and stronger when we stand together. We know there's great strength in aligned voices, but there are also a lot of things that hinder our alignment, including our own shyness of reaching out to our neighbors and our own sense of just overwhelmedness with our day-to-day -day work. We will have to give up some of what we're doing if we want to change and grow. We cannot do it all. And that's where we get hung up the most in libraries. We are so determined to continue doing everything that we've been doing, and we are gonna have to make hard choices to give up things that we don't think we can give up in order to build a better future for librarianship. Chance, choice, change. This is not a moment to play it safe. It's a moment that demands risk taking and ambition and innovation and strong networks of people that work together with a powerful shared vision that society itself advances when knowledge and information are saved and shared as broadly and as openly as possible. That work can certainly help to transform librarianship. It may even help us to transform the world around us. Thank you guys. How did I do on time? Ooh, I went over. I'm sorry. Is there enough time to do one or two? Sure. Okay. Let me monopolize all your time. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, I wanted to share our experiences with web archiving at the Illinois State Library. Awesome. We were uh, archiving all of the Illinois, just, just a the government of Illinois government websites. Awesome. And what we ran into was so much of the data was locked up in databases. Yep. So we'd have tables that would have to be different permutations to get data views. Uh, cold fusion pages, which oh. were dynamic. Uh, legislation, so you'd have the legislative bill, but you'd also have comments about the bill, you'd have amendments, so all these things would have to join together. Right. So while we were running a huge 10 terabyte system every month doing C just simple CVS uh, changes, not even full page drafts, right. We rapidly decided that we're, we can't do that. We're going to have to go to a system where uh, people actually contribute. So instead of being a passive system, an active, system. active system. So that has been our experience with Prince. It's harder than simply screen scraping <coughs> and pulling in URLs. It's much harder. And until right. there is some mechanism that can, intelligent agent that can build databases from views and things like that, and know how to do that, it's, it's a really hard and really challenging proposition. The problem is that until there's enough demand for that That's tool right. to be built, it's not going to be built. And you are one in a room full, and you're the only one who has concrete experience, with the exception of Alice. No, yeah. Alice and I. And are you guys yeah. doing it together? Yeah. Well, there you go. So, <coughs> so what I would say is bravo, first and foremost, to the State Library for tackling some web archiving. It puts you in a minority already. And now the challenge is making sure that you connect up with others who are doing web archiving to share your knowledge and to find out what they've learned as well. And I know that one of the things that's happening right now is the Memento Project, which is uh, Herbert Von Dessemble, who was one of the ones that created OIIPMH, for those of you who remember OIIPMH yeah. when it first when exploded them. Yeah, so I mean, they're, they're doing some work that should make some of this easier in the future. But it's complicated stuff. You know, it comes back to it's hard. It's not impossible, but it's hard. And if we're not all trying to invest in this direction, there's not going to be a proposition great enough to make us build the right kind of tools to, to capture this. And please comment, if you will. Mm -hmm. To me, to oh. my mind, and I could be completely wrong in this, OAI PMH and OAI ORE are dead ends and old technology. <laughs> and I think to build, so we have all these scattered archives of digital images and yep. things like that. I think the way to go with that is to build uh, semantic web interoperability of those images. 
I, I don't want to put you on the spot. No, put me on the spot. That's what I'm here for. I would say it's a gold ring, and that's the only danger. We've been working on semantic tools for the last decade and a half. It's so complicated. And it's, it's super, super complicated. And so the question is, how do you take several approaches simultaneously so that you're not putting all your eggs in one basket? So as that semantic web development's going on, also having things like DPLA, where they're trying to figure out ways of incentivizing players to at least get their stuff into hubs and then maybe try to clean it up once it gets to the hubs. And I mean, there is no perfect solution. But as long as we have a couple of streams of attempts going simultaneously, hopefully we'll get to that end goal. I'm really worried that we, and I'm sorry guys, forgive me. I'm really worried that we have so few resources that we have to make an intelligent choice now. Right. Because there's so much out there and we, if we continue with old tech, with things that don't work, we're throwing away time, money, and materials. That's right. I'm sorry. No, I completely agree. Okay. Yes. Can I ask you to put together something I've seen as a slight disconnect for the first part of your presentation to the second part of your presentation? When you talked as a sociologist and a scholar, you talked right. about how innovation happens and how change happens, and you talked about, I love destroying the lone genius um, myth where it takes people. And, right. you know, that brilliant idea that gets brought by a network of people that carry <coughs> forward and that turns into change. Yes. Okay. So the. Oh, go ahead. I got that part. Okay. <laughs> and I, I love it because to me, what's very interesting is you know, as we know something, as we learn something, we carry it on, we change. Okay. The disconnect I see is in the second half, you talked about libraries as these repositories of information and knowledge. Now, the academic in me says that's an interesting use of the word knowledge because it's sort of synthesized that it's something that can be abstracted and created as a set thing that you can sort of hand knowledge together. And yet, in the first part, it's clearly the idea of you know, how do we support the community and the network of people, not simply by supplying them documents and web archives, right. but talking about how does this lead to real change? Because when you talk about librarians as activists, they're not going to become activists because they go out and grab the web. They're be grabbing the web because they're activists. Right. They're, they're not going to become change agents because they've documented well, they're going to be, use documentation to change. To change their community. And so, you know, so I'm, I'm wondering how, sort of the third act is, how do we put this wonderful narrative mm -hmm. with these wonderful resources mm -hmm. into a human-centric mode of change? And I think that that is the bullseye question. And Anne, I would watch him and have him keynote in a couple of years and tell us all what he's figured out, because I don't have the answer. I think that you're pointing to one of, one of the spectacular gaps. <laughs> it's all yours. <laughs> no, but you're pointing to one of the spectacular gaps. We can see mile markers along the way, like I said at the beginning of the presentation, but that doesn't mean we can actually predict where to go. And I, like you, believe that, that the networks of people and the, the networks of information, that information itself is, is living. It's not just these dead documents that we store. And that that's part of the, the, it's part of the message that we need to be spreading in terms of the advocacy work that we do about libraries. And it's also it's part of what we need to be delivering to our communities. But I don't know quite how to make that happen and materialize. And I'm depending on li library leaders throughout the, the networks that we have right now showing the way. So as you show the way, please report back. And as you see things that are starting to show the way, please report back. Yeah. I see in my sons who are teenagers, well, one's just 20, but I see in them a complete <coughs> disregard for privacy issues. Mm. They, yep. don't, they yes. don't acknowledge that yes. there is any such thing as a privacy issue. If someone asks them for their personal information, they don't even bat an eye. Mm -hmm. And I don't, in talking to their friends, I don't, I don't perceive that their friends have any sensitivity to the impact that their openness will eventually have on their generation. Mm -hmm. And I, my question for you is, do you have any experience where there are people of my son's generation, I don't even know what it is, Y or Z or I don't know, <laughs> double A or whatever. <laughs> I like double A, that's great. You know, is there an emerging sensitivity to the fire that they're playing with? I don't think that there's much. And I think where you do find it, it's where grown-ups have instilled 
a sense of recognition of what privacy means. Um, and part of, oh, school librarians, yay. So, so maybe you guys can actually answer this better than I can. I teach um, elementary school, so um, we do. I do try to talk about privacy, and it, they're still little. And it's really interesting the things that they say back to me about what their parents teach them and do. And they're like, "Oh, well, my dad just downloaded Thor off the computer," and I'm like, "Eek! You're not really supposed to do that. Like, that's kind of." You know, things like that that they throw back to me. It's like I'm trying to teach them the right ways to to navigate the internet as well as try to remain private. Like, you don't, don't use your names so or using code words, you know, things like that. But then they, it's not being held up at home. So it's a really hard battle. The digital citizenship lessons that are out there are excellent. And there are some excellent ones for um, teens, like NetSmarts, that parents can use and educators can Common use. Common Sense Media. Common Sense Sorry. Media. But until I get that, catch that student one-on-one -on -one and show them what I've seen of their social media, they still have no idea. Mm -hmm. So the best thing for me is when I'm on those computers and watching those students in high school, and I say, you see that website you're on? And I pull it up on my computer, I said, there you are. She goes, oh yeah, I'm on that website. I'm like, I'm not logged in. That's your face on my computer. So until I can have that one-on-one -on -one experience with each child, they, they don't get it. Mm -hmm. right. I'd say there's a generation, yeah. about 15 to 25 maybe, that has completely missed that boat. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my son did a, great did a great paper on the NSA, he came home and tape, put a piece of post in front of his webcam. <laughs> understands privacy as a currency and not as an absolute. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's very different. Yeah. But I don't think that's necessarily like wrong. Is there a video out there like Netflix or something in the middle school library and they always do with the kid and they remember it? They call it a stalker video. But it's yes, that, kid, that one's good. some of you probably know. So it's just, it shows how a girl in a chat room who doesn't reveal anything too personal, she does what she's supposed to do, but she reveals just enough that they're able to basically locate her house ultimately. And they yeah, do it right. all in like 10 minutes. Right. And it's one of these videos that's scary, but the point of it is to scare kids, to, to show them how important it is. I would like to think <laughs> that it has made an impact, but I would agree with the other school librarians and someone who teaches this, that I don't think it... They think about information and things very differently than we do. Yes, they do. Yeah, uh huh. Yep. Well, right. We've, we're, we're all now going to Google Docs, so they're using the Chrome oh, yeah. browser. So we're actually encouraging them to yeah. share sure. everything. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's using the Chrome browser is kind of amazing. You go over to your, I've, I've got a Google tablet, and you're like, oh, it's got all my stuff that I searched for on my computer, you know? Yeah. And it wants to share my contacts if I download this app. Right. So we're kind of. <laughs> So the important thing is that we're all talking about it. And, yeah. and I think that that's part of what's missing right now is that I'm not hearing these conversations, and especially not across library sectors. So even just this little bit of connection that's happened right now in this room, if we could replicate that, and then if we could also connect, yep. and then if we can also connect groups like ACLU and NSA, well, maybe not NSA, um, if we can connect to other groups, um, we. Yeah, they're already connected. They'll be watching what we're doing anyway. Um, but anyway, it, it, it is this conversation already, I think, is an example of the type of networks that I'm encouraging uh, all of us to work to form. Please help me thank the amazing. <laughs>